Good evening. I want to thank the foundation uh, for the opportunity to be awarded this, this honor. I've had a very um, cherished part of my heart about New Trier. My father uh, was born in Wilmette, a block from where I was raised on Forest Avenue, which is very close to the Machine Shores uh, Club. So that area of Wilmette, Winnetka, uh, New Trier has always held a really fond uh, part of my heart. I do want to start out by saying one thing. I, I think I owe you an apology. Uh, you'll see I'm not wearing a coat and tie. I, I live in Guam, Micronesia, and the Philippines quite a bit, and it is extremely hot. So this is, the, this is a Filipino barong, which is acceptable for a coat and tie. You can argue for the Supreme Court. <laughs> if you wear a long sleeve barong, which I do have on. So I do apologize for not having a coat and tie. I haven't owned one for over 15 years. Uh, I want to thank the nominating committee, if I could, for all the work, particularly Diane and Mike Stott. I was a very reluctant applicant. Mike Stott contacted me. He hadn't seen me for, I don't know, 30 years. And I said, no, I'm not interested. I'm a very private person. Three weeks later, he contacted me again. Three weeks later, and finally said, OK, you fill out the application. I'll, I'll, I'll go along with it. So they did that. And I'm just very proud to, to accept this award. I'm a little bit humbled, if not to a great degree, when I read the prior awardees, as well as these current ones, in the academic, professional successes they've had, I've always considered myself basically an old athlete. And uh, when I read, and I really enjoy the presentations of the current present uh, awardees, uh, it's just amazing what the graduates of New Trier have accomplished over these years. Um, one of my favorite stories, and, and Denise asked me to kind of mention some of the things in, in New Trier, how they may have impacted me and given me some of the drive that I've had over my life. And um, this may sound silly, but I love Latin. And uh, some of you of my vintage might remember Evelyn Patterson taught Latin. I had her for three years. She was not a warm and cuddly person. <laughs> uh, some would say professional. I would say not warm and cuddly. <laughs> Uh, there were no makeup exams. There was no extra credit. And her phrase to me was, you know, you, you deserve the grade you got. And, and if you didn't like it, work harder. Now, that sounds really silly, but I think that's the ethos of, of Nutria. It was very competitive uh, for me, particularly in athletics, but even academically. And uh, I've, I've thought about Mrs. Patterson. I'm also embarrassed that a lot of my friends would remember their teachers from grade school, high school, college, remember their names. I don't remember anyone other than Mrs. Patterson. <laughs> and they mentioned that I was a Navy SEAL. I was there for five years. Back in the early days, I was class 54 in BUDS. Now they're up to 300. But anyway, no one knew about SEAL Team back then, very few people. But um, there's been a lot of notoriety about SEAL Team. And uh, some of it's very well earned. Some of it's not so deserved. But they have the same thing now that they had then. That's called Hell Week. Uh, basic UDT SEAL training is 26 weeks long. The sixth week, you're down to about 15% of your class. My class started with 180 some odd. And by the sixth week, we were down to 40 or less. And Hell Week, you go six and a half days with no sleep. And it's extremely mentally stressful. They use cold to work on you and break you down, as well as the physical exertion. But going back to Mrs. Patterson, <laughs> you start Sunday morning, and Tuesday night is usually, if, and, and, I, and I was an instructor my last year, if you tell them, if you make it to Wednesday morning at daybreak, you will make it all the way through Sunday. And that's when you finish Hell Week. They don't believe you because they're in such pain saying, I haven't finished even half of it yet. But what they would do is they use cold. So even though it's in San Diego, Coronado went through, it's very cold in the winter in the water. And so at 1 o'clock, I remember Tuesday night, everybody's focusing. I'm, fo I'm going to make it. I just got to make it to daybreak. And Bill Sullivan, a very good friend of mine, he could run like a rabbit in, in soft sand with combat boots. He could do the O course, everything physical. He could beat me except in the ocean. He was my hero. And we're laying there, and what they do is they, they, you lock arms, you face the surf, and you lay there for 15 minutes at a time. The surf's breaking over. You can't see if it breaks. They're just letting you get cold and cold and cold. Then you run out, run in the sand, get sandy. They call it get wet and sandy. And you go back in. And Bill Sullivan, it's 2 o'clock. He's just got to make it till 6. He says, I can't take it anymore. I got to quit. And uh, 
Tom Richards, who made Adamo, was on his other side. He says, no, no, Bill, you can make it. We're talking to him, trying to make him laugh. Get him over anything other than what his brain was telling him his body couldn't take. And we got him down. He was fine. Well, 20 minutes later, he just breaks his arms. We're back in the ocean, gets up and goes off. And what they do with them is you ring the bell three times and they immediately get you out of there because they're afraid you'll impact someone else who will quit who was really could have made it otherwise. And I've often thought about that because I was, after he left, and I'm saying, I just got to make it till dawn. I just got to make it. I thought of Mrs. Patterson. <laughs> I swear to God. And you do, you do hallucinate. Sometimes you're paddling in the middle of San Diego Bay in the middle of the night, and you're convinced ships are coming by you because you're hallucinating. You haven't had any sleep for, sleep for four or five days. And I was laying there. We're all locked in there. And he, she just came to my mind. Why? I don't know. I have no clue. And basically, I just remember saying, you deserve what you get. And I thought, I don't want to get what Bill Sullivan got. And so uh, I made it through. I said, you just got to work harder. Focus on the short term. And that's really been a, a function of my life, I think. Um, we've all had our failures. We've all had our successes. The measure of me, of either a man or a woman, is not how many failures, how many successes, but when you have a failure, how do you get up? And you may feel sorry for yourself. You may take a while, but get up and move on. Keep on trucking. I've always seen that in certain ads. And going back to Nutrier, what I enjoyed was they stressed excellence, both academically and athletically for me. We were very fortunate in the year I was through. As she mentioned, uh, Sports Illustrated wrote a six-page article on our senior class saying it's the finest uh, high school swimming team in the history of the United States. Well, we were, we were quite good. We had 20 some odd uh, uh, All-Americans on our team. Um, in any event, I remember Dave Robertson, the coach. And he was a coach, so he wasn't in the academic field. But his goal was that state championships, nothing mattered. Our arch enemy, Evanston, didn't matter. You know, we're going to beat him, but focus on the state championships. He also stressed academics. Now, I remember we had the swim team had, my year, I think 170, Mike, if you remember, it was a huge team. Football team only had 120. But it was a huge team. We had three workouts. So the C team, who had my best friend, uh, worked out from like 7.30 to 9 o'clock at night, five days a week, just to give you an idea of the dedication some of the swimmers had. But I always remember Dave Robertson. His point was, you think, don't think as a high school kid. Suburban championship doesn't mean anything. His point was state championship, state championship. But his assistant coach was Ray Essick. Now, Ray was an interesting guy, I think, and don't turn us into the NCAA, even though it was many years ago. We were the first high school team that trained year-round. And we formed a Nutrier Swim Club, of all things. And that's, as I mentioned earlier, we went to the, the state, uh, excuse me, the national AAU championships against all the colleges, and we scored third. Only Indiana, which had 12 world record holders on the time, at the time, and Yale, uh, were the only teams that beat us. We beat Michigan, Southern Cal, Stanford, everybody. And we're high school kids, a bunch of skinny little guys. And we did really, really well. But anyway, that, day, he, that was the ethos, I think, of Nutria, both academically. Keep striving. And it's OK to fail, but get up and keep on going. Ray Essick was the same way. Even though he was an assistant high school coach, he went on to coach uh, Southern Illinois. And then he spent 20 some odd years with the Olympic Committee at the training facility in Colorado Springs. His point was, don't think about the Big Tens. Don't think about the NCAs. Those are just stepping stones. You think about the Olympics. That's all that counts. So he started training us in the summer, our sophomore year. And I liked the fact that everyone I met at Nutrier, in my frame of experience, it was stressing succeed. Whatever you may do in your life, succeed. And I really enjoyed the lady, I'm sorry, whose name escapes me, that was in the weaving. What a unique life she had and how successful she was. And I can't help but think the Nutrier experience had something to do with that. It was a very unique experience and one I real, really cherish. Um, and so, it really, I just want to say that. I appreciate this very much. I want to thank the foundation. Um, but again, Nutrier has meant quite a bit to me over the years and uh, will for hopefully many years more. So thank you very much.